as mentioned, um, I'm Sherry Johnson, and I'm half of the Cat's Paw team. My partner, Yolanda Hayes, is actually working today, so it's just going to be me. And we uh, started this business about, I guess it's been nine years ago now, actually. Um, really didn't mean to, but but we did. We are, as we mentioned, located here in Georgia. And we do everything um, from designing to printing to shipping um, all of our products. We just, I am at a loss here. Um, what we what we actually do, let's let's move on to that. We, as mentioned, everything. We do scenic details. We do animals, birds, figures, buildings, vehicles. Um, pretty much anything a customer's requested. We've done aliens, Bigfoot. I know that I think Larry has one of our Yeti on his, his layout. We do pretty much, we do trains, we do vehicles. We get different requests for different things that, that can range from small to large. Okay, and I don't know what happened. Is my screen still full for you guys? There we go. Um, we also do uh, lighting. This screen is uh, some of our products would fit right in with your today's clinic. We've got our, our flickering products. We've got campfires, burn barrels, barbecue grills. We have lighted gas pumps where the like the old style gas pumps with the globes on top. We have have those which we have lit, our ghosts for Halloween. We've also lit some of our buildings. We do the, the, the flashing traffic barrels uh, to warn people where and where not to go. And the new product that we're coming up with that's going to allow more animation on the layout is called Invisitrax. When we first started the business and we did Bigfoot, everybody kept asking us to make Bigfoot move through the woods or through their layout. And it's taken us about eight years to figure out how to do it, but we have a product and probably within the next six months, it's, it's gonna be released to the public. So we're excited about that coming up. So you'll be able to uh, have Bigfoot or other vehicles, animals, people, you name it, anything else that you would like to have move on your layout, Invisitrax will be able to, to help you do that. Where can you find our stuff? Well, as mentioned, and here we're with the group with model railroad layouts. Um, another big target group are the farm toy people. They deal a lot in 164th scale and in the winter time, they're very popular because they're all snowed in and not having to do with their farms. Okay, am I back? Okay, all right. Farm toy displays, uh, like I said, they have a lot of uh, shows just like the uh, Model Railroad. They usually do theirs in, in Missouri. People have used our products on slot car layouts, which is how we actually got into the business was I wanted stuff for my slot car layout. Oh, we have them, people use them for their die cast displays. There's one here where the gentleman has the uh, our gas pumps where he puts them in with his large 18 wheel truck display historical dioramas, and we're actually gonna feature one of those. School projects, we get a lot of parents are going, my kid needs to make a scale replica of, can you or do you have people? Do you have things that can go in this layout we need to make? So pretty much we make stuff for anything and everything. Um, another example, um, Tom Barker, who's very big with the American Flyer, he used our figures uh, and has done a stop motion video. Um, Pete, who's here in Atlanta, has got our campfires on his layout. The uh, Christopher Steve, where we've got the cows, I, I mentioned the farm toy folks, he actually won a $10,000 grand prize featuring our cows, which we were very proud of that. That was quite a mark. 
this is uh, one of two historic dioramas we've now participated in. This is the first one. It's located in Cuthbert, Georgia, which is on the southwest side, close to Alabama. Um, and actually, I have a little video that goes with this one that, that can describe more about what it is. But when we started, Mr. Jimmy asked us to do 50 figures. And by the time we were done, we did over 400 figures and animals and buildings and carriages. And it was a very unique project. And I'm gonna let this little video play that Mr. Jimmy did explaining how important um, scale replicas are and historical dioramas are, and as well as the parts on there. My name is Jimmy Bradley. I'm on the Board of County Commissioners here and worked with the commissioners to do the work restoring this building. I'm very active with HO model trains. And when we were working on the restoration of this building, the issue of the trains came about because of transportation. We started looking for some ideas as to what could we do that would emphasize how transportation fit into the growth of Randolph County about that time. We picked the time period because of the use of the trains to bring the injured in here right at the end of the Civil War. The first thing we did when we got started was to try to, to get a, in your mind what Cuthbert looked like and how things happened and what was going on. They started the journey into town from the railroad station and uh, we tried to depict the things that they might have seen. For instance, there's a carriage there. The carriage is still in existence today. It has been restored. It's in a museum, but it was used to meet every train to carry at least one person around one of the hospitals. We depicted where they went by the old, the old courthouse that it used to be in the middle of the square. We tried to depict the businesses as best we could that they look like in the names. Some of the buildings are still there is the, uh, the, the lawyer's offices that are right across the road from us here. The Methodist Church is right across the street over here. These buildings are still here. Near about everything on there is, is to scale, but handmade to look like the things that were there. I made a trip to a train show in Atlanta and I ran into two ladies there. They run Cat's Paw LLC and they were selling figures. None of them were anything like I wore it. And uh, the, one of the ladies said, uh, well, we can make you anything you want. So my wife and I made a trip up to Locust Grove where they live and watched them make them. But uh, I, I stood there and told her how I wanted a soldier to look with his leg blown off or his arm blown off or whatever. Roughly 400 figures that are on that diorama. Uh, we described what we wanted them to look like, including the wagons, the people. Tried to make it just as realistic as it was during that time period. Conservation is not preservation, but you but you still want people to be able to relate to how things work. And sometimes the only way in, in, in this visual, uh, a picture, but something like we did there, and that's why the little people were so important understand the horrible suffering that went on and then the, the great and the great gift that people in Cuthbert gave to try to help. And I need to give Mr. Jimmy credit. He scratch built every building that's on that layout and he did an amazing job um, with with creating that. And like I said, if you're in the area, it's close to the Alabama border, South Georgia, and it's worth going over there, seeing the little town, going to the courthouse and taking a look at the layout. And since then we actually did, that's all HO scale. Since then we created four or five O scale pullouts. They wanted to take, they took key aspects and made them large scale and put them in their own little separate display so that they could be a focal point. Um, the impact that 3D printing has had on, on scale layouts and modeling, it's allowed unique items become available. I mean, like Mr. Jimmy said, he described each figure that he needed or what he needed, and we were able to design it and create it. With traditional processing and tooling, things like that just aren't possible. We do a lot of customs. Uh, the gentleman there cutting meat is a, a representation of my late father. He was a journeyman meat cutter. Um, 
Christmas ornaments, which we do for the grandbabies, dragons that we've done for people that have castles and have um, knights battling dragons. These things can all be created and printed and put out there. We can also go in and do replacement parts. Uh, a lot of things, the tooling has been lost over the years or the company's out of business. And if you've got something that's broken, you can use 3D printing and you can go in and recreate that item and fix the parts. Uh, we work with uh, one of the local companies here um, who repairs a lot of things and they're forever going, can you, can you make this? Uh, we, we don't have this anymore. American Flyer doesn't make this or Lionel doesn't make that. And we've done a lot of work making parts so that we could redo things. And with 3D printing, it's easy. You can go from uh, a, a hand sketch with dimensions to a 3D design to a printed object, test it, see if it works. If it doesn't, you can modify the design and keep on going. 3D printing also offers scalability. Um, which means I can design something to one size, which we usually do in S 1 64th, because it's kind of in the middle of everything. And if I can create it in that scale, I can usually go up or down without too many problems. We have created stuff as small as Z scale, even though I swore I'd never do N. We did N and then I've done Z. We've gone all the way up to G. We've done stuff for dollhouse folks, um, which I don't have listed on our places of things, which is actually 1 12th scale. So once we have the design done, we can just scale it on the computer and print it at whatever size we need. Standard scale, in between size, we've done some strange ones. Another aspect with 3D printing and running a 3D printing business and selling items, we don't have to carry a lot of inventory. We can print on demand. Now, our popular items, we do have inventory because um, we print multiples at a time. Other items that aren't as popular, uh, we print those on demand as needed, which saves a lot of space because if we had to carry inventory of everything, it would overflow more than just the garage and the guest bedroom. I'm gonna focus now on the technology used and we're gonna primarily look at the printers that are used at home for what they call the desktop and small business. We're not gonna go into the big printers at the big print houses. These will be the ones that you can purchase and use at home. 3D printing is additive manufacturing, which means it builds or creates an item by laying down a layer, then another layer and another layer. This is true no matter what type of 3D printer you're doing, even the big fancy ones. It's still created by layering upon layer upon layer. You can produce a lot of complex shapes this way, um, which you could not do with a traditional milling process where you had to go in there and cut it out. Or if you were going to make something and create a mold, a, a two-part mold, a lot of things if you have undercuts you couldn't do. 3D printing allows you to print these items because you don't have to worry about molds and undercuts. Unlimited creativity. If it can be drawn on a 3D computer, it can be printed. Okay, I will say that's probably 95% true. There's probably a few things that can't be done. But as you heard Mr. Jimmy say in the video, you know, he, he asked and Yolanda said, sure, we can do it. Um, so... We kind of agree with, yes, it can be done. It's toolless, which means once we design that 3D object, we can send it off to the printer. We don't have to make a mold. We don't have to hire somebody else to do anything. We can do it ourselves. No third party is, is required. And if you folks get brave and go into the, the 3D printing area, if you haven't already done so, that's the great part. You can do it right there at home. You don't have to get anybody else involved. Complex objects can be done in pieces, just as with anything else. You might need to, to break it up, or if you're going to light something, break it up into two pieces so that you can get your LEDs in there or mount it to a building properly or feed it through your track. Depending upon what you are printing, 
you can use different materials. In the filament-based world, there are ABS, which is like a Lego building block, nylon, you can get carbon-infused filaments. So depending upon what you're actually going to use your final print for, you can determine what type of material you want to use. Do you need it strong? Do you need it flexible? Do you need it to glow in the dark? The same is true of resin printers, and we'll talk more about these differences momentarily, but there's also different resins out there that are strength, durability, flexibility. Um, I'm playing around with one right now that is for doing gaskets so that I can make custom seals on, on things so I don't have to try and find a washer or a gasket on the market to fit something that's really old. I can print it. Basically, the, and the, the top two 3D printer types are the two we're going to focus on, which is the FDM, or one that uses filament, kind of looks like a uh, weed eater string on a, on, a, on a reel. With those type of printers, you can print at about a 0.2 millimeter thickness. It can go as 0.1. So you're going to see layer lines. If you bought anything off of eBay or if you've bought stuff from us um, that has been printed on those, you can kind of see the layer lines and, and feel them. Currently, those printers, actually, I've seen a couple now on sale for less than 200. They can go between 200 and 3,000. The resin printers or the digital light printers print at a much finer layer line. We're looking at 0 0.05, so a much thinner layer, which means the layer thicknesses are hardly noticeable. They're still there, but for the most part, you can't see them. The prices of those printers have dropped now too. You can get those between $200 and $2,000. For really cool stuff, the material jet or multi-jet printing, which is what folks like Shapeways and some of these other uh, large 3D printer companies use, they can print even thinner, use multiple materials so it's easier for them to print things. They can print a lot larger things, but the price is also $45,000, which is why Yolanda has not let me get one of those. It was hard enough getting the first one at $3,000. Um, it was a fight. I got it. And, and we move on from there. The printers that we currently use in-house um, have been the MakerBot, or the, which are the filaments. We typically use machines that have two print heads. Now, MakerBot has changed over the years, and there's a lot of other companies out there that make printers, but one of the reasons we choose a printer with two print heads is so we can print in two colors or two materials at a time. We're going to discuss in a little bit that some items need support material. With having dual print heads, we can print the support material in one type of filament that can be dissolved in water, and we can print our actual physical item in something else, which makes cleanup a lot easier. In-house, we typically use ABS because, like I said, it's strong, it's durable, it's a, a Lego building block. It's probably going to be here forever. Other filaments out there are PLA, which is very popular, easy to print with. HIPS, which is a great little filament, it dissolves in limonene, so it can be used for support. Depending upon, again, what you want to, your end product, where it's gonna be used, you might use nylon, which can hold up to high heat. So if you're gonna print a custom part that's gonna be in, say, a steam engine, um, sitting behind a smoker, you're gonna want something that's not gonna melt, something that does high heat. So you would pick a filament accordingly. How the FDM printing works. I mentioned it lays down things a layer at a time. Basically, you buy your filament on a spool. Um, it's 1.75 millimeters in diameter. It gets fed using a, a series of stepper motors into a heated head. That head then extrudes the melted plastic at point zero, well, yeah, 0.2 millimeters, so a nice little thin line, and it lays that down layer by layer. Since it comes out hot, it's, you, you stop before it's molten. It's, it's pliable, but not molten, and then the next layer comes down because it's still hot at that point, it sticks together. 
A big problem with these printers is if it gets too cold or you get a breeze, it can cool and mess up your prints. For complex shapes, I mentioned doing supports like on this little Yoda head or Grogu, um, we would have to put support material underneath his ears because you can't print anything out in the open. That, that molten plastic has got to, to lay down on top of something. I'm going to show you a little video here of it in action. Our grandkids, though, who are four, six, and eight, were visiting last year, and they watched the printer do this every time I printed something. It just fascinated the kids. Now, in reality, that took two and a half hours to print. The time it takes to print something is based on how many layers, how far that print head has got to travel around, because at the base it printed a short distance, in the middle of the base it went a long distance. So print time is based on the travel distance and per layer and the number of layers. So this object, which is a little over two inches tall, had 298 layers. So it took two and a half hours to print 298 layers. 3D printing requires a lot of patience. It's not fast. No matter what you've seen on TV, and it gets me every time I see a TV show where it's like, oh yeah, five minutes later, we've got this 3D printed object. No, it takes hours. Depending upon the size, it could take days. The resin printers that we use, uh, we've been using the Inacubic, but there are, again, several others out there um, that are equivalent. We've got five of those now. We've got four of the FDM printers and five resin printers. We use resin made in the US. We're trying to source all of our products in the US. And again, we can pick a resin depending upon what we're actually printing. So if we're doing gears, we use the engineering resin. It's formulated for mechanical objects to be um, interacting. For tires, for gaskets, we use the gasket resin. For doing our figures, um, since they're so small and have arms and legs that are fragile, we use what they call the Hero Tough resin, which can you can drop it and it survives. It doesn't get brittle. There are a lot of resins out there on the market that do get brittle and will break if you drop them. So again, you want to be careful and pick the right material to print with. How does the resin printing work? Well, this works a little different. You have a vat or a big bowl that you pour the resin into. Underneath that, in the bottom of the printer, there is a projector. And basically, the, the printer projects a mask and it cures just the items that are, that are masked. And it does this one layer at a time. So you have a build plate that comes down. The resin is cured by UV light. The build plate comes up, lets more resin flow in. The next layer is cured with light and so forth. It too requires to have support material for things that have overhangs, because no matter what platform you're on, you can't print in midair. And here's a little video showing this one in action. It's a lot more boring than, than the FDM printer, because this one's just basically up and down, where the other one goes back and forth and up and down and all around. And you can 
see this model of the Eiffel Tower has a lot of intricate detail, which is where the resin printers shine. See at the bottom, this took almost eight hours to print. When working with resin, you'll have to deal with the number of layers. And for this, it's just a little under five inches, this was 2,418 layers, a considerable number of layers more than the other than the bowl on the FDM. To print here, the time is based on the layer height, because you can go smaller, and the exposure time, the lift time, as you saw, it kept going up and down. You can adjust how much time goes with the up and down, and different resins require different exposure times. My fast resin, I can print at three seconds a layer. The gasket resin gets printed at 19 seconds a layer. So there's a considerable difference in the amount of time it would take to print the same object with those two resins. I want to go back just to the, the bowl for a moment. Um, on that one, I actually printed that in the resin as well. And it took three hours and 47 minutes compared to the two and a half hours that it took on the FDM printer. And it was 11,072 layers versus the 298 layers. So big difference between the two. Just gonna hit briefly on the, the big printers that they use at like Shapeways or iMaterialize in case you all use them to outsource some of your 3D printing. They have the big ones that usually use two materials um, where they have the bowl of resin they actually squirt a little liquid in that gets cured of the two different types of materials, one for support and one for the build material. And the support material is typically wax, so it melts away. They can clean up things much easier. And it goes a lot faster than the printers at home. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I'm going to show a real quick video of this, and it's mostly how it cleans up. they can use a different type of support, they can use the wax, they can actually print in even finer detail. For the home printers with the fine detail, you have to use supports for things that can sometimes interfere with some of the detail. I did say that you couldn't print in thin air. Well, that's for the big machines. There are 3D printing pens, and these are pretty cool. A lot of kids and are using these I use this to fix problems. I am not as good at the 3D print pen as you will see in the video that it has. But it basically is like a hot glue gun on steroids, except it uses the filament like the FDM printers. And you control how fast it gets extruded. It's hot. You don't want to touch the trip. And I love this. This is, and notice that they're not starting out midair. They're actually starting on something and then they go midair. And I am nowhere near this with a 3D printing pin. This type of, of printer would be good for doing organic things like trees and flowers and bushes and the landscape. Or if you're really good, you can do bugs and lizards. That's so cool. I wish I could do good stuff like that, but I, I don't. 
Um, comparing the two, in case you're looking at getting into 3D printing, this is uh, a comparison that shows where the FDM printer is good for large, lightweight, moderate to detailed objects. The resin printer is good for high resolution, smaller, a lot of good detail. The cost for the materials is about the same between the two. One huge roll of filament um, costs about the same as a one kilogram bottle of resin and both print about the same amount of stuff. If you're going to get into 3D printing, you need to take your environment into consideration. Both of them, both types of printers can put off some fumes. You need to have a well-ventilated area. They are both susceptible to humidity and temperature fluctuations. So if you have plan on putting it out in the garage, you're gonna to need to make sure that they stay warm and it stays dry. And in the case of the resin printer, since UV light cures the resin, you wanna make sure you don't have any stray UV light coming in from outside. So I've got our printers out in the garage, the windows are covered, it has its own heater and air conditioning out there and dehumidifier. Um, continuing, here's some examples where you can see the difference between what the two printers can do. Um, on the gears at the top, you can see on the left, the one that's printed with the FDM printer versus the resin, the difference in the smoothness. The same with the image below that, the gasket, you'd have a hard time getting something on those threads on the FDM one where the one on the resin has nice clean threads. So it just depends upon your need and size. If you're going to be printing large buildings, the FDM, the filament-based printer, is the way to go. And the flaws that it creates actually makes things look more realistic like wood and brick. A lot of people um, ask about the cost of printing. And you'll see a lot of people who, who sell things online and they're like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna charge you what it takes, you know, the, the amount of material it takes or the amount of time. Well, there's a lot more that goes in to an item than just the material. When you're looking at the cost of printing, you do have the material cost, whether it's resin or filament. There are also consumables that go along with both types of printers. For the resin, you need gloves and masks um, rags for cleaning up, FDM printers, you need chemicals for both for cleanup, acetone, Kapton tape. When you're dealing with the true cost of printing, you need to add all that stuff in. You also need to add in some manpower costs. You know, it takes time to set up the print. It takes time to operate the printer. It takes time to clean up the, the print afterwards or the post-processing the actual printer operation itself and its upkeep because parts wear out on it. it. Takes electricity to run that printer. The accountant who told me you got to put in the cost of the printer and do depreciation. I don't know about all that, but she did it and it's there. Printer parts because as I mentioned, things over time are going to fail and need to be replaced. Nozzles, belts, build platforms. The actual print time goes into printer operation. As we saw, some stuff can take three hours, some stuff can take longer. Post-processing, usually this is the one everybody forgets about, is the cleanup. You gotta remove the support material. If you're gonna sand it, if you're going to paint it, if you're going to assemble it, all these things factor into an actual price of a part. I know that Shapeways gets nailed a lot of times for how expensive their stuff is, and it is, compared to what you could do at home on your own. But when you start adding in all this other stuff, you find out that it's a little more costly than you thought, but it's not overwhelming. All right, how do we do it? Because we mentioned we do the design all the way through the end. Well, first we get the spark of inspiration. We'll come up with something or a customer comes up with something and I would say 90% of our products have been requests from customers who need something on their, on their layout or for spe a specific project. So we get the request, then we take a look at it and we research, we try and get um, actual dimension drawings, photographs, we create everything true to scale. So if it's a garbage can, rest assured, we were probably out there measuring that garbage can and making sure that when we did it, the scale right, that it scaled correctly. 
At this point, we also want to make sure that we're not infringing on anybody's copyright or trademarks. You will find that in our product catalog, we will have uh, round coolers that we will say are like igloo coolers. We can't call them igloo coolers because igloo is a registered trademark. If there's something that someone else has done that's similar, we may change ours so that it doesn't infringe on someone else's or make it slightly different. Once we get all of our drawings, we, we do all of our checking, we go ahead and we start scaling those numbers. So as an example, our phone booth here um, is typically 21 inches wide. Scaled this to 164 scale. So we're looking at that 21 inches to being a little less than eight and a half millimeters. Big difference. Next, we take those dimension drawings and we create the object in our 3D computer program. Um, and we're gonna cover a list of those in a little while. We create it, um, we refine it. If we're going to do it in multiple colors, like the two print heads or print it in multiple colors to be glued together, we need to break the object down into separate parts for each color. So here you can see the phone booth all together and the three different pieces that it's gonna be for the different prints. Once we have the CAD file done, we have to convert it to a format that the printer understands. Unfortunately, they don't understand what comes out of the CAD program. They understand STL, Standard Tessellation Language, which is just a fancy name and word for describing just the shape of the object. When you print something, it doesn't care what colors you're using. It just cares what the shape is. Is the material here? Is there not material here? Once we've done that, it has to be sliced. Remember the printers create everything a layer at a time. So we have to slice that model into those layers. But before we do the slicing, we need to make sure that it's going to slice okay and actually be printable. Even if you purchase models from the, the internet or for someone, it's always a good idea to make sure they're printable. It has to be watertight. It can't have any holes in it, um, which means an object, if, if you're doing a solid object, it needs to be solid. It needs not to have any errors. If you're printing two objects, they actually need to be touching so that the, the printer or the software thinks it's one object. They have to be manifold and there's software that takes care of all this nitty gritty stuff for you that will check for the errors. And we'll cover that too. Once you check it for the errors and we can see that my little phone booth problem here, my little phone booth had problems. One of the utilities that I use most to make sure pointed out with all these little red and pink dots that I've got problems. Another program that I use called Make Printable said, I've got 142 non-manifold edges and four shells. Well, you know, it all looked like one to me and it looked pretty good, but it still needed to get fixed. Once it's fixed, we actually do the slicing. Now for FDM printers, I mentioned that we print a 0 0.2 mil two millimeter layer thickness because you're melting plastic. For the resin prints, we go down to 0.5. And the thing to remember is the thinner the layer, the longer it's going to print, the better the detail, but the longer it's going to print. The quality of your print is determined not only by how good you design it, the material you're using to print it with, but also the software used to slice it. There are different software programs that have their strengths and weaknesses, and we'll cover some of those. Once it's sliced, and here's a little video animation showing how the stand for the phone is, and it's 522 layers, and that shows you the layers being processed. Typically, you wanna go through this little process of showing each layer because sometimes things get missed, and it'll show up if a layer is missing or not missing. Once we've got it all sliced, we send it off to the printer, and we hope for the best. 
usually the first time we print something, we get stuff that looks like this. Uh, a lot of times we get stuff that looks like this. Or on the resin side, we get things that look like this and you're going, okay, what did I do wrong? Well, you never know. But when you get stuff like that, we go, we start checking the printer for problems because sometimes a nozzle might be clogged on the FDM printer. On the resin printer, there might be a little speck of cured resin floating around that we didn't notice. Check for humidity or temperature. The other day when it got cold here, I had to up the heater in the garage so I could get successful prints. If everything there is looking good, we go back to the original design to see if there's something that maybe we could change so that it would print better. When you design an object for 3D printing, you have to keep in mind how it's going to get printed. We make any modifications, separate it out, do the conversion, do the slicing, well, do the repairing, then the slicing, print it, and usually the second or third time we actually get something successful. We might have to alter the dimensions if it's off for a test fit. It, it's a trial and error process. For us, we usually print something five times before we bring it to market because sometimes something will print the first time or the second time and then the third time or the fourth time, you can't get it to print at all. So we like to make sure that we can consistently print an object before we bring it to market. Post-processing. For resin prints, it has, when you, when you saw the Eiffel Tower come out of the resin, it was hanging upside down, it was still dripping. It has uncured resin on it. So for a resin printer, you have to wash that off. Typically, I put mine in an alcohol bath, in a plastic container, stick it in the ultrasonic cleaner for three minutes, and it washes all of that uncured resin off. Once that is done, resin also needs a final cure. It has, it's cured for the most part, but you have to do one final cure to can finish sealing the object. It's kind of like a sealing cure. And that can be done with a fancy wash and cure station or I just buy a bunch of UV lights because UV cures the resin and just put my stuff underneath the lights. Support removal, another big process. And this is done no matter which type of printer you use. As I mentioned, you can't print things in midair. And this, these two photos show you a figure on the left that's got supports underneath him. And one of our weather vanes on the right showing the supports needed to get him to print. All that stuff has got to get removed once it's done. And it can be done uh, with uh, a set of, I use the wire cutters. Um, you can also use scalpels, knives. Got to be careful when using X-Acto knives. I had an urgent care facility and 11 stitches by the slip of a hand. So you got to take that into consideration too. Additional steps, if you're, especially if you're dealing with um, an FDM printer or the filament printer, because of the layer line, sometimes you want that smooth. So you might sand it. Um, on a resin printer, you might have done a support and when you cut it off, it left a little dim dimple in there and you wanna fill that in. You can fill gaps, big gaps. I use the 3D printing pen. You can use um, I love ABS slurry because I can take some of my ABS filament, dissolve it in acetone, and then lay it out to fill in a gap. And once it hits the air, the acetone dissolves and I'm left with nothing but ABS. Or with the resin, I can take a dot of uncured resin, put it into the spot, hit it with a UV flashlight, and fix it that way. Hobby knives, scalpels, jeweler saws, hot knives are all critical with support removal. Sanding, I have up here a little picture of this sander. It actually goes back and forth and the print head or the sanding head is about three quarters of an inch. This is great for wood or anything that you need to sand something small. For me, when I use a Dremel, I always wind up getting the big grooves in there. It's like, oh, that was supposed to be flat. Since this sands flat, I don't get those grooves. I love this tool. I have two that I use and one in backup because I can't live without these. 
Also, since we're dealing with plastic, if you have a bump on a print and you don't want to cut it off or sand it off, you can melt it off. And you can use like a, a hot knife, a wood burning knife. They actually have tools out there, which this one um, that I have a picture of has different heads on it. So it's got a curved head if you want to melt something curved in. It actually has a great little tool if you want to countersink in, um, say, a screw or a bolt. You can fit it in there, it heats it up, and you can stick it in there and melt the plastic so that it fits, fits your bolt. Love that tool too. Gluing, people always ask, and I see this a lot in the forums on Facebook, how do you put your parts together? Super glue is always an answer. Um, it works pretty much on everything. Um, if not, you can always get your two-part resins. That works. Again, I use the ABS slurry to stick stuff together, or I use the, the resin. If you've seen those commercials on TV with the little resin pin where it brings out the, the little liquid and then they hit it with the flashlight, same principle, same thing. When working with resins and those resin pins, always wear gloves because if it's, it's UV cured. And if you get uncured resin on your hands, you're okay, but if any UV light hits it, it will cause up to a three, third degree burn. Very, very caustic with, the, with the, the burn there. So always wear gloves. People ask about painting. You can paint a lot of 3D printed items, some with enamel. I know a lot of the ones from Shapeways you cannot. I always recommend acrylic paints. They're safe. They don't interact with any of the chemicals or most of the, the printing. If you use a spray paint and you've printed something in ABS, you want to make sure there's no acetone in it because acetone melts ABS. So your acrylics and your other spray, spray paints, you have to be careful. With the acrylics, you don't. I mean, it's water-based, no chemicals, and you can pretty much paint any 3D print, painted item with acrylic paints. All the way from the cheap ones you get for 50 cents at Walmart up to the more expensive army painter, which, which are really nice paints. I just moved up to those. The software that we use and some useful links. For designing, um, there's a couple of different types of designs. We're gonna talk about mechanical design, which would be like buildings, garbage cans, more physical objects. Tinkercad, a lot of people say, oh, that's too easy, it's a kid's thing, but Tinkercad, is very powerful. You can start a design there. You can do a lot of work there. A lot of people have been doing a lot of great stuff there. I would say 80% of our products all well, started in Tinkercad. Anything's mechanical, we started it in Tinkercad. It has a great feature since Autodesk bought them out and Autodesk owns Fusion 360. They now have a feature where you can send something from Tinkercad directly to Fusion if you need some of the higher end functionality, like doing camphers or fillets or anything like that. I throw Blender in there in the middle. Um, Blender can do a lot. Blender is very confusing. I have never really taken the time to learn Blender because it's so confusing. I rely on Tinkercad and Fusion. There's also some other apps out there like SketchUp, um, SolidWorks, Rhino, FreeCAD. Everybody asks, what is the best software to design in? My answer is whichever one you feel comfortable with. If you know Blender, use Blender. If you know Fusion or SolidWorks, use those. Because the only good software is the one that you're using. For more organic designs like animals and our people, um, we use Daz 3D, which is, which is great. There's a little picture of it down there on the left that shows that you can get different people, different body styles. You can pose them, you can get animals. It comes with a basic set and then you can purchase add-ons. You can purchase clothes and props and all sorts of things. Poser is pretty much the same thing, animals, birds, people. Um, it doesn't have as big a support community anymore than Poser or than Daz. To be honest, I haven't used Poser in quite a while. I started out with Poser 20 years ago, but now I use Daz. 
ZBrush, which is actually, they have the core, which is free. And basically you start with one big blob and you sculpt like clay. You have different tools where you push and pull and mold. You don't have anything to start with. You start with a blob. And this is pretty cool. Um, if you're coming from a traditional sculpting world, it, it a lot of people love it. It's got a lot of features to it. Blender can also do this type of sculpting where you can start with a blob or you can import other shapes and modify them. Again, I, I, I don't do it in Blender because for me it's too complicated. I will confess to that. Modifying and repairing the files. Mesh Mixer is a staple. Um, it now has been bought by Autodesk and is it's, it's still available, but its features are now included in Fusion 360. And you saw where I used it to check for issues. It too has tools where you can smooth and pull and pull um, to modify an object. It's, it's great for like adding fur to animals or accentuating eyeballs and stuff like that. Mesh Lab is very similar. It has a lot more features, a lot more complicated. I use it probably for repairs only. NetFab Online. Notice this one is one of the ones that I had to update. Um, I went to use it the other day and it was no longer there. Autodesk bought NetFab. We see a trend here. Um, they have now merged its functionality into Fusion 360 where you can now actually do repairs in your design program. You don't have to do a separate program for repairs, which puts Fusion kind of out there ahead of everybody. Make Printable is actually an online service and I use them quite a bit because they can fix things that I can't find. Um, they also will let you scale things there, hollow objects, so if you're printing with resin and you want to cut down the price on something large, you want to hollow it, make a drain hole so you have just a shell. It can adjust thicknesses of walls. It gives you a lot more options for repair. It is a paid service, and I believe you can pay per model or you can do different types of subscriptions. I have the ultimate subscription because we do so much work and, and I just it's easier for me to run it through their repair. We mentioned slicing, the, the programs used to, to create or to take your design and put it into layers. For the filament printers, Simplify 3D, which is unfortunately a paid program, um, is awesome. It has tons of features. You can control the dual extruders. You can change speeds, color, um, thicknesses. There's just so many things that you can do. Slicing can be a whole, whole, whole little clinic on its own. Cura 3D, which the Utilimaker printers use, um, is open source, it's free, and they pretty much have profiles for most of the printers out there. It too gives you a lot of options when slicing. And then the old MakerBot print, um, actually I had to update that because the one I was using is no longer supported, but I need it for my old printers. And it too lets you set how hot you need the plastic because depending a, upon um, the material you use, like HIPS needs to be, it needs 250 degrees Celsius to melt. ABS needs 225 degrees Celsius to melt. PLA only needs like 120 degrees Celsius to melt. So these are things that you need to set so that you can get your slices and get your plastic flowing the way it should. Same with resin. Um, different ways of slicing it, different options. All of these are free. Chitubox is probably the most used at the moment. And this is where you can set the, the layer thicknesses, the amount of time it takes exposure, how fast the build plate goes up and down. Lychee is another one that's come out and does the same thing. It too is free. Um, I like Chitubox, but I'm starting to love Lychee because it has better auto supports. Prussia Slicer, it can be used for both FDM printers and for resin printers. I put it on the resin printer page because it has a great auto orientation and auto support. It will take a look at your model for a resin print, 
and go, okay, if it's angled this way, it will print better than if it's angled that way and add supports. Now, one other program is on here. Once you slice a file, your sliced file can have problems. So there's another tool that we use called UV Tools. It goes in and it takes a look at your sliced file to make sure that there's no issues with it, that there's no extra little islands where you might have needed a support and you didn't get one there. Another free tool. So we get this question a lot too. I can't draw anything, but I have a 3D printer. We see this a lot in the forums. I just bought a 3D printer or I got a 3D printer for Christmas, but I don't know how to print anything. Where can I get files? Thingiverse is probably the most popular or well-known. You can get a lot of models up there. There's a lot of stuff up there for model railroading, new stuff going up all the time. I just saw some new engines up there. And remember, with 3D printing, just because somebody scaled it or created it and say HO and you do O, you can always scale that HO up. Or if you do N, you could scale it down. People are like, well, I need an N version of that. Just get the HO and scale it. Cult is a, another one. Um, it has free stuff and it has models that are paid for. And you can also buy STL files from them. My Mini Factory, they're another one. CG Trader. CG Trader is good if you're looking, um, especially if you're going to do mechanical housings. I saw in the lighting that, you know, if you have an Adreno and you need an Adreno box, they probably have a CAD file for that Adreno mounting or LEDs. If you need to mount uh, individual LEDs and something, they've got a lot of different housings for those. Turbo Squid is where you pay for your models. And of course, Shapeways. If I download this file and I print it, can I sell it to my friends and post it online to sell it? No. People do it, but no. The creator to put a lot of work in designing that file and putting it up there. And almost all files that are up there will have a license that says personal use only. You can't make any changes to it. You can't sell my file. You can't sell prints from my file. There are a couple of exceptions. Some people will put up there for com commercial use. If the licensing, when you download the file, says commercial use, then yes, you can print it and sell it. Still can't sell the STL file itself, but you can sell the print. If you're ever in doubt and you've got a really cool file and you want to sell it, go back to the person that created the file and say, hey, can I have permission, your permission, to sell a print, to sell prints from this? Um, I can tell you now, if you're going to Ford and you want to license their products, they'll say, yes, you can sell a 3D print and you can pay us $250,000 for the license to do so. And then you have to battle with Mattel and several of the other toy companies that already have licenses. So it's, inter it's interesting when you get into licensing. Okay, what if you don't have a printer, but you've created something that you need to have printed? A lot of the popular software printing providers, Shapeways, of course, which is probably the most well-known, whose prices have gone up again. And I just saw where they are now charging a processing fee to print your file, which is new. Um, iMaterialize is good. I've used Sculptio. Um, and we also, if you send us a file, we can also print files for you too. We have several customers that send us their, their CAD files and we print for them. Where can I learn more about 3D printing and kind of designing for 3D printing? Because we've hit just the very surface here. There's a great book, and I started with the first version of this. I think they're up to their third edition now. The 3D Printing Handbook. It's great. It talks about the different technologies. It talks about how to design for printing. Um, you might need something that is a four millimeter square. Well, when you go to print it on an FDM printer and the printer kind of oozes out in the side, that's going to probably be like 4.2 millimeters square. So you have to take into account when you design something for, for printing, the printer you're using, the material you're using, and adjust your design accordingly. And this has got some great 
tips in there for all the different printers, also on how to do supports. Functional design for 3D printing, it's aimed more for the filament printer, but it is great because it talks about weaknesses. If, if you're building something layered this way and you put a lot of force on those layers, they can separate. So it talks about positioning for printing for strength. It talks about actually 3D printing uh, hinges and how to do it so that they don't break and which materials to use. Both of these books give you a lot of good information if you're gonna get into 3D printing and doing your own designs. They, they're excellent reads. And I put the links um, to Amazon. So if you actually uh, pull down the uh, handout from our website or the video from our website, those will be there, click the hot links. The, the last one is just kind of a fun book because, you know, I talked about my, my printing failures. Well, there's actually a book dedicated to 3D printing failures. And there are some pretty cool failures out there. They're, Mute me. There we go. Okay. Um, which uh, hopefully you heard the part about the failures. Which brings us to the end where we get ready to do our question and answer. But I want to let you know on our website in the lower right hand corner, there are links to this presentation uh, where you can print a PDF version, which also has the hot links to the books and to all these websites. Um, there are also links down that corner where you can see more information about the, the whole cut for it layout. I, I highly recommend going to that and taking a look at, at the detail work that was done on, on that. And if you go to our website and you place an order, you are NMRA members, please use the discount code when you check out because that will give you a 10% discount off of anything that you've purchased from our store. And we're good for questions and answers. Well, thank you, Sherry. That was a, certainly a comprehensive and good uh, presentation. I guess there's, as you said, with your experience. There... God damn. Did you mute him again? Yeah, I guess I was muted there. Well, I, I just thank you for your presentation. That was really good. Uh, that, that was a lot into it and uh, a lot from your experience and everything that really goes into it. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess, do you have anybody have any questions? Uh, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, I've got a short one. Okay. Uh, you mentioned a, a small sander, which intrigued me. Uh, what, uh, what, what is that? What, you know, is that a, a Micromart item or? Yes, it is a Micromart item. Okay. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and if you give me just a moment, I'll actually run out to the garage and get it and show it to you. No, that's okay. That's okay. Right. Well, I'll find it. <laughs> All right. Um, I, believe, we'll find. I believe in the presentation, I actually put the link to it. But yes, it's the Micromart Micro Sander. Okay. And it's, um, I've used that for years when I was doing dollhouse work and when I got into doing the, the trains and stuff. I mean, it is, it's great. Yes, Micromart, and they too have an NMRA discount. Don't forget to use their discount. Yeah. Thank this, you. Is Bruce, this is Bruce DeMayer. I have a question. Um, a, an awful lot of us, when we're doing our structures, run into the windows and doors issue. And the, sometimes the windows can be very odd sizes. They're not something that you can order from a manufacturer. And, uh, and I would love to be able to scratch build them. If you think about a window, is a, it's almost in a single layer. It's not 3D. It's two-dimensional. Is there, are there materials that would print almost perfectly clear glass or close to clear glass? There are um, 3D resins out there that are clear. I actually have some, but they, they never really stay clear. One of the, the issues is mm. when, when you print with the resin printer, it's printed with little dots and it's still rough. And once you clean all the nice shiny part off, it, it, doesn't stay as clear. You can coat it with, I use um, clear acrylic floor polish because it's cheap. And that will bring it back. But typically if you're going to do just like a window pane, just buying some flat sheet 
styrene that I mean I get mine from Plastrux. It's you know what point it's 0.3 millimeters thick the clear styrene and and I just cut it and aside from 3D printing I have like one of the the Cricut um, cutters that you use for scrapbooks. It has a little knife and you can basically because that's how I do the windows for our buildings and the windows for the bus. I create the shape of the windows and use the Cricut to, to cut those windows out. And I did those for Mr. Jimmy because in the one building for Cuthbert, it had 115 windows in it and he did not want to cut those all by hand out of, out of clear styrene. So I set that up on the Cricut and it went through and, and cut all those windows out in like two minutes. Yeah, but the problem that with that is, is most windows have panes in them. And so you're trying to show the, the definition of the pane. Yeah, I'm working in end scale, and that ends up being a very, very small detail, but it's an important detail. What I would recommend, I mean, would be printing the window frames separate and then putting the, the clear plastic behind it. Okay. Yeah. Would be, yeah I, that's probably what you're doing now, so. Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks. You're welcome. See, so you have a question? Is I have a question for Sherry. Yes. Uh, really, really enjoyed your presentation. Very, very interesting. Thank you. And clear. Uh, I was wondering, is there a way to scan an object and create a file that can then be 3D printed to replicate the object? Yes, but with a caveat. Um, when you 3D scan something with the scanners that are out there and there's also photo geometry where you can like use your cell phone and take photos as you walk around something it will create the object but it's typically not a hot not a lot of detail and it requires a lot of cleanup work it it, it it brings in a lot of errors to get something where you one a good scan, there are high-end laser scanners, which are typically in booths, and they run about $100,000. The, the, the scanners that you can get, the hand scanners that, it, and I've tried three different ones to do that, and I've gotten rid of them and just go back to drawing things by hand because the clean, I could draw it by hand faster than I could clean it up. So it's yes, but with a caveat. Thank you. You're welcome. Cecil, so, uh, are any of the resins recyclable and can you make your own filaments? Um, the, the, the resin, we keep, you can keep using the resin that's in the vat until you run out. Um, so there's really nothing to recycle because you just keep reusing it until you run out of the resin. The, the filament, um, there are machines to make filament uh, where you can grind up plastic. You have to actually get the grinder to grind up the plastic and then put it in this machine that will then extrude the filament. By the time you do that and the success rate, it's just cheaper to buy filament. Um, the, the one company that's here in the U.S. that does their filament, their, their extruder to, to make sure the filament is the correct 1.75 millimeters all the way along is actually they say 700 feet long in the warehouse. Um, and the, the printers are real picky. If it's 1.9 millimeters, it'll jam. If it's 1.2 millimeters, it won't feed through. So it needs to, it needs to be precise. But there are kits and, and products out there where you can buy the thing to make your own extruder or your own filament extruder and, and make your own filament. Thank you. Wow, there's a lot. There's a lot to this thing once you get into it. Wow, how do things and everything. Does anybody else have a question? No, but I got a comment. Technical. If you ask a question and uh, please mute after you get through uh, uh, getting an answer from uh, from uh, Sherry, please. Okay. I've got uh, several questions, and I'm wondering: uh, Do you have an email address that? Uh, I can use to ask you questions? Um, yes, it is actually on the very last slide, but it is I, info, info, I-N-F-O-164 at 
catspaw, C-A-T-Z-P-A-W.com.